So we'll start with uh, Anthony Pyatt. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you, Wolfgang. And um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I think what I'm going to say may seem a, 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 an odd mixture of uh, wildly too specific on the one hand and wildly too general on the other, but that's what philosophers are like. Um, the world of contemporary politics is full of private diplomacy. NGOs of many kinds are trying to affect the domestic and foreign policies of countries large and small. When Human Rights Watch publishes a report on free expression in Burma, or the Committee to Protect Journalists issues a new release on murders of journalists in Mexico, they're trying to shape the domestic policies of those countries and the foreign policies of other countries that might influence them. Even if you don't call this diplomacy, you have to accept that conventional diplomats must take account of these actors on the political scene. So I want in this brief talk to do two things. First, I want to describe a case, and second, I want to sketch a few issues that I think it raises, both for the states whose policies they aim to affect and for the conduct of foreign policy towards those states. Figure out how this thing's had to, had to ch change to the next page. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Good. Here's the case. Um, the first Penn Club was founded in London in 1921. Penn's original members included Joseph Conrad, George Bernard Shaw, and H.G. Wells. These writers came together in the shadow of the First World War. Their aim was to build international literary fellowship, and as they said, and I quote, to defend literature against the many threats to its survival which the modern world poses. They believed that if the writers of all nations could build links of friendship through their shared concern for literature, the nations of which they were citizens could become closer to friendship too. A year later, the Penn American Center came into being. Over the years at the annual Penn International Congresses, new organizations in new countries have been admitted, and there are now 145 Penn centers in more than 100 countries, members of what's called Penn International, which can claim to be the oldest literary and human rights organization in the world. About a decade ago, some Chinese writers in exile and at home decided to set up an independent Chinese Penn Center, which is usually called ICPC. There's been a Penn Center in China since the 1920s, but it's not been on the forefront of working for free expression in China, and these writers wanted to found a new center that would do that work. So that's why they called themselves the Independent Chinese Penn Center, and they were recognized by Penn International in 2001. The Penn American Center worked with ICPC to help get them support from the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington. Roughly 250 members inside and outside China are doing courageous, on-the-ground advocacy work for freedom of expression in China, despite constant pressure from the Chinese authorities. One of the founders of the ICPC was Liu Xiaobo. Liu served as president of the ICPC from 2003 to 2007, <coughs> held a seat on its board until late 2009, and is currently an honorary president. ICPC is now a leading source of information about threats to writers and journalists, and an important voice for freedom of expression in China, and it has come under increased pressure. Its meetings have been interrupted and cancelled by authorities, its officers and members are regularly subject to intimidation and surveillance, and many have been detained and questioned about the center's activities. Liu Xiaobo is one of at least six Penn members currently in prison in China. In the last few years, ICPC and the Penn American Center have worked closely together on free expression in China. How do I know this? Because I'm the president of the American Penn Center. Um, we have re uh, Recently, we have regularly written to the Chinese president about cases, including Liu Xiaobo's. We have written to, the, to American presidents, secretaries of state, urging them to raise these cases in high-level contacts, which they have done, and not because we told them to, but, but they have done that, and coordinated with other pen centers, for example, the Norwegian, British, and Swedish pen, to ask their governments to do the same thing. On Christmas Day 2009, Liu Xiaobo was sentenced to 11 years in prison for seven published sentences, for publishing seven sentences, which were mentioned in the official verdict of the court. The court cited the exact passages. A week later, we at the Pan American Center brought together writers on the steps of the New York Public Library in the snow to protest and to read translations of those seven sentences to the press. We took a letter to the Chinese legation to the UN. We asked our ambassador in Beijing to speak to the Chinese government on his behalf. We spoke on television to CNN International in Hong Kong. We sent a colleague to visit his wife in Beijing. And we asked President Obama to bring the matter up in his meetings with the Chinese. And we went on writing to the case, on the case to the President of China. Earlier this year, I wrote to the Norwegian Nobel Committee as President of Pan American Center to nominate him for the Peace Prize. And in September in Tokyo, a week before the Nobel Committee was scheduled to make its decision, more than half the member societies of Penn International gathered in our annual Congress, and we passed a detailed resolution mentioning many of the individual cases, including Liu's, and uh, uh, that delegation delivered uh, the uh, uh, um, resolution to the Chinese Embassy in Tokyo. 
and also ICPC organized a news conference about Liu Xiaobo in Tokyo. When the Peace Prize came, the government of China blacked out television broadcasts on CNN and the BBC and the French station TV5 that reported it. They censored sites on the web and emails and text messages that mentioned him or his initials, LX. Indeed, comically, they've censored some references to free expression in the recent pieces of Wen Xiaobo, uh, the Chinese premier. Much less comically, they have harassed Liu Jia, Liu Xiaobo's wife, destroyed her cell phone, literally, physically, surrounded her house and placed her effectively under house arrest. Her friends have not been able to be in touch with her since October the 20th, though she appears to have been able to send messages out through Twitter. It's not always easy to identify where those messages come from, of course. The Chinese authorities have also stepped up pressure on members of the ICPC as part of their campaign to limit information about the awarding of the prize. And since the prize was announced on October 8th, dozens of ICPC's China-based members have been visited by police and harassed, and several of its leading members are living under house arrest. There have been scores of outrages in recent weeks, I could give you a list of them, many of which appear calculated to keep the Chinese people in the dark about Liu Xiaobo's award. But they indicate the fact that the international attention to his case is something of genuine concern to the Chinese government. Close after the announcement, a group of senior retired party officials, including one of Mao's secretaries, spoke out on the need for greater freedom of expression. And Premier Wen, as you know, has regularly spoken about free expression recently, including in the weeks leading up to the awarding of the prize. So we know that there is real internal debate within the regime about these matters. At the moment, the hardliners and the security apparatus have the upper hand. But the top levels of the party, I believe, are largely committed to moving forwards towards greater political freedoms, not least because it would help them deal with one of the most serious problems facing China today, which is the extensive political and business corruption uh, that uh, pervades life in that country. So we, I believe, can help them move more sure-footedly in the direction that many of them want to move anyway. OK, so that's the case. A couple of issues this sort of private diplomacy raises. First of all, Penn is focused on only one dimension of Chinese policy. Our concern is with free expression and the surrounding political freedoms of association. Unlike state-based diplomats, it's not part of our job to consider these issues in the context of broader questions of trade policy or cooperation on the global environment or anti-terrorism or fisheries policy, any of the great hosts of matters that are involved in bilateral relations with China. On the questions that concern us, the Pan American Center, like uh, CPJ or Human Rights Watch is willing to criticize governments everywhere, including our own. This means that we are not always in harmony with either the foreign or the domestic policy of the government of the United States. We keep in touch with the desk officers for countries in Washington, where we keep in touch with our ambassadors abroad and with bodies like the Congressional Executive Commission on China, a statutory government body in Washington, but we don't take our marching orders from them and we do not always do what they want us to. So we can continue to put pressure on these issues that concern us, even when our government does not find it convenient for us to be doing that. And because we aren't an official body, our government can sincerely repudiate our positions in private or in public if it chooses to. The Chinese government can pretend not to understand these things as they pretend to think that the Norwegian Nobel Committee is an instrument of the government of Norway. But they know, in reality, that we will continue to speak about these things so long as we believe that we can advance the cause we are working for. This means that the costs we impose on them in terms of their international reputation are one element of the calculus of those who make China's policy. As a theorist, I've recently been thinking about the role of considerations of national honor. This is now too hopelessly abstract, no doubt, uh, in shaping political action by states and their citizens. This is a case where this is an important force. Many ordinary Chinese, it turns out, are pleased when they discover a fellow countryman of theirs got the Nobel Prize, even though, since the government has been suppressing information about him, they may never have heard of him before, and they know that official agencies describe him as a criminal. As a result, the Nobel Peace Prize for Liu, which I should perhaps remind you, is itself the act of a non-state actor with a human rights focus, puts pressure on the Chinese regime internally. Since China is also trying to learn how to be a great power on the world stage, it also has concerns for its reputation, say, in Africa and Latin America, and the prize imposes costs on the continuation of its current policy towards its own citizens.